Well, welcome, and thanks for coming. Uh, I'm a developer advocate, the IBM Watson data platform. So we do a lot of work with uh, managed databases and analytics. And through the course of that work, we built this tool called Pixie Dust, which is the which is the topic of this talk, but it's kind of, this is a short talk and Pixie Dust is a big, is a big project with a lot of different implications. So <clears throat> the talk is gonna be half code demo, half sort of um, motivation behind uh, why I think it's important. And what I hope to get out, I'm doing a lot of motivation because I don't have enough time to show you in code all the things that are cool about it. But I want to encourage you, give you enough reason to go back and either become a user, take the time to become a big user, or even become a big developer on the project. So, jumping right in. Um, so Harvard Business Review I really like because unlike some of the tech magazines, it's, um, it's a little bit more down to earth and more useful in what they say. But I want to start off with this one about data-driven decision-making. Um, the rise is real but uneven. And so, you know, this is, um, it's a real movement. Data-driven decision-making is, is making big inroads into um, corporations, relying less on intuition and more on data. And you'll see here this graphic from the article. So in one industry, U.S. manufacturing, um, 2005, about 5% usage of data-driven decision-making and go up to 2010 and it triples. So it's definitely um, something that's, you know, that was a while ago now. I think it's even bigger. But I think the most interesting thing to me was that the rise is uneven. And why is that? And I think that's a people issue. Oh, I can use this clicker. And this is what, this is uh, how it really relates to us. <clears throat> uh, data science is, you know, a really hot, hot field. Suppose somebody said a year or two ago that it was the sexiest profession around right now. But the data problems tomorrow cannot be solved by data scientists alone. And this is one of the key themes of this. So as the data-driven decision-making movement grows, um, us, the people in this room, we're being pressured to know a lot of stuff and do even more. So I don't know, how many people in here consider themselves a web developer or a full stack developer, some kind of developer? And how many consider themselves statisticians? <laughs> or, and then data, does anybody consider themselves a data scientist? Yeah, a lot, okay. And then what's the last one? Uh, a mathematician, anybody consider themselves a mathematician? Okay, and how many people feel like they have to be all four of those things to do their jobs right now? <laughs> Great, because this whole, the theme of the first part of this talk is how stressed out being in our job is right now. So we used to just have to do one of these things, build a web application or build a data visualization or, um, or build a machine learning model. Now I think we're being asked to build, or tomorrow we'll be being asked to build combinations of those, put all those together to create solutions or applications. And not only build them, but also be stable, scalable, extensible, and uh, methodologically valid. And <clears throat> they're going to have to do all these things because these will be mission critical systems. The businesses are going to be riding on them. So. You know, how do we do this? How do we, how do we work to blur the lines between developers and data science, scientists and statisticians? So, for the half of you who aren't being asked to do this, if you weren't stressed in before you walked in, but, but you are now, I think, I'm sorry, but I think you have to be. <laughs> um, as I said, you know, JavaScript frameworks, um, every language, database backends, we need to know all these things at once and then add in the data science languages in R and Scala and Python and all the databases that go with them and then put on top of that machine learning models. And um, I don't know about you, but I just wanna go be a furniture maker sometimes. But if you're not ready to do that, which <clears throat> I'm sort of 50-50 myself, 
um, and you want to try to make these work in an organization, I'm going to go through a little story about how we're building Pixie Dust, this tool which helps to bridge the gap. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about how we see organizations. That wasn't supposed to happen. So when I came into IBM a few years ago, just three years ago, we talked a lot about this. System, three types of systems. Systems of engagement, systems of record, and systems of operation. And I'll spend a little time on this because I think it's really important um, in understanding technology. So systems of record are generally what what a business, what runs a business. Um, if you're in retail, you have point of sale systems. You have to track, you know, who's buying what. You have to track the sale. You have to take that back to inventory and get the product out to the person. You have employees, so you need ERP and HR systems. You have CRM systems. And all of those are sort of record the actions of the business. Systems of engagement are ways in which you, you know, not really quite how the business, running the business, but ways in which you reach out to customers maybe, or partners. You'll have you know, social media applications and websites and partner, um, partner channel management applications and, and a bunch of stuff there. And then systems of operation are really about systems that, that instrument the stuff, the hardware you might have. If you're you know, shipping stuff around the world, you may have uh, systems that monitor your you know, fleet management systems that monitor your truck trucking. If you have industrial equipment, if you have pipelines and things like that, you'll have, you'll have technology that monitors flow rates of water and the heat of pipe pumps and things like that. So all these come together, or you know, back Back before things got more complicated, they just, you bought an ACID compliant database for your system of record and it never talked to the other stuff. Like there was no way to get information from your point of sale into your marketing campaign, which is a system of engagement. Ah, why is this thing going crazy? <clears throat> but now more and more, you know, as, we be, as we're being asked to make data-driven decisions, you're gonna wanna know you're going to need to combine all these. So for example, if you have a customer, let's say you're Gap, and you have a customer who has a Gap card, so you know who they are when they check out on the website and they put in an order for you know, a pair of jeans, you're going to want to, that's in your system of record, and you're going to want to be able to feed your system of engagement so next week your marketing people can send them an email saying, hey, this this shirt goes well with the jeans you just bought last week. And that's the kind of data-driven decision-making we're trying to, we're trying to um, create. And what we need to do to do all that is systems of orchestration, which don't exist yet. <clears throat> and so my pitch to you is that the Pixie Dust open source framework that we built on top of Jupyter Notebooks is the beginnings of a way to stitch together these systems to create a system of orchestration. So I'm going to, to further um, convince you that this is worth getting, digging really deep into. I'm going to tell a story about uh, a project. And we're going to start off with the people involved. So we got Ben, the full stack developer, pretty experienced in, in uh, his job. He's got a master's degree in computer science, a lot of experience programming knows some core languages and some front-end stuff and some core databases, NoSQL and relational stuff. And then we have, oh, and here's his motto. Best line of code is the one I didn't have to write. And Natasha is the data scientist. She's a mathematician um, by training, and she, but she's got some good experience with uh, big data work and machine learning. And she, you know, she knows some coding, Python and R, but software engineering is really not her, her specialty. And she loves data. So here's the story. That <clears throat> all of a sudden, surprise meeting with the VP of development with his two, big, two biggest hotshots, Natasha and Ben. So we have an urgent need to build an application for marketing that can provide real-time sentiment analysis on Twitter data. So you've got six weeks to build it. 
And your target consumer is marketing staff, so it must be easy to use, and it must scale out of the box. So look at using Apache Spark, which neither one of you have ever used before. So they start brainstorming. OK, so Ben's the full stack developer. Um, you know, familiar with Twitter APIs. I'll work on data acquisition from Twitter and enrichment with sentiment analysis and uh, scoring, using, scoring using Spark Streaming. I know Java, but I don't know, don't know Python. I don't have time to learn on this project. And, uh, but Scala is very close to Java, so that might be possible. Natasha can do the data exploration and analysis, and she knows Python and R. And she likes pandas and NumPy, but you know, able to dig into Spark if it helps. Oh, this clicker is OK. So how can they collaborate? They have different lang they know different languages, they have different skill sets. Um, you know, a little bit of technology overlap, but they can't, for example, work on the same <clears throat> they can't both be told, okay, you're gonna, you know, build a big Java project and and work on the same collaborative code base there. So our idea is how can we use Jupyter notebooks to to help them collaborate and create, sort of orchestrate the work between a full stack developer and a data science scientist. I'm gonna skip this because I think from being at this conference for a day, everybody knows about Jupyter Notebooks, right? <laughs> anybody? This is for a really different audience, um, some background on Jupyter Notebooks and how it works. Spark, is everybody good with Spark? Probably better than me. So basically, Spark is not a database. It's, uh, it almost, it sort of manages your storage and figures out how to, how to distribute jobs across um, any number of databases or flat files that you can, that actually store the information. But what's important here is the whole combination of all this. So, you know, if you look at the business chart I talked about, the Venn diagram I talked about with systems of, of engagement and uh, record and, and operation, you'll see a lot of those ideas expressed in technology here. <clears throat> so Spark is really well positioned as a sort of orchestrator for all these things. Spark allows you to, or at least the ecosystem we built up around Spark and Jupyter Notebooks, allows you to <clears throat> interact with data. That's the Spark, you know, the Spark part. And at the notebook level, you're able to bring in a lot of libraries that cover you know, things you'd want to do, an analytical task you'd want to do in a lot of those different systems. Stats, math, machine learning, just visualization. And in a notebook <clears throat> you know, with Python coding, you can obviously reach out to web APIs and bring in a lot of services that you might want to use. Can, oh, that's spelled wrong, Cog, cognitive. That should be cognitive. <laughs> So, you know, with IBM and Watson, we do a lot of, we're going to reach out a lot to Watson, um, Watson services to do some natural language processing and sentiment scoring, things like that. So, you know, we found that this ecosystem around Jupyter Notebooks and Spark is really well suited to orchestrating all those areas of business. So Ben's never seen Notebooks. But they seem pretty powerful, but they look complicated for a developer. Because remember, he doesn't know Python. But he can write some good Java code. So <clears throat> this is where we start talking about code finally. So Pixie Dust, finally talk about this. So Pixie Dust, um, the thing Ben is going to love about Pixie Dust is he can write an application that pulls in Twitter data, does all that. Um, does all the interaction with the Twitter API, gets back all the tweets, and you can just package that up into a jar, and Pixie Dust will allow that jar to be brought directly into the notebook and sort of run it, and run it as an application. We'll also see um, Pixie Dust as a helper library, so that if you're familiar, if you've been working in Jupyter Notebooks and doing a lot of visualization with Matplotlib or Bokeh, you can, you know, be highly focused on your task of analysis 
and then just lose a half a day on learning how to get some line in the right place in Matplotlib. And Pixie Dust visualization library is designed to automate a lot of that stuff and get rid of, you know, stop the context switching for going in to figure out how to make a chart, a bar chart or a pie chart or all. It's not perfect, you'll get a lot of text overlaps and all, but it's great for getting the, you know, roughing out your analysis, roughing out the full thing. Maybe you'll have to go back in later and do some hand coding of, um, hand Python coding of the, to get the exact look and feel of the chart you want, but it does a great job of, um, I guess, exploratory visualization. And then there's some other <coughs> helper things that are built in that like download and export data using Scala. I'm not, I'm not a Scala programmer, so the, cool, the lead developer of Pixie Dust finds this really useful. He's an amazing developer. But being able to share variables between, between Scala and Python, let's say there's some library you really want to use in Scala. It's not available in Python. Um, Oops, but you really want to go back and forth between those two, you can do that with Pixie Dust. And that's some weird magic that I don't even, I can't even explain how that works. Um, so I'm gonna jump into the demo mode a little bit and show you how Ben Is this looking? That's looking good. How Ben gets the gets the Twitter streams into a uh, notebook. So here I am. How am I on time, by the way? Okay. You got about 25 minutes. Okay. So this notebook is sort of self-contained. A lot of what I'm talking about is in here in documentation. Um, I'll go through the architecture a little bit first. So we talked about this a little bit. So Twitter data is going to come in as an input stream into Spark. That's going to be a program that's written. And that's going to be enriched with uh, emotional tone scores using by reaching out to uh, Watson Tone Analyzer service. And then it's going to come into the notebook as processed data. Uh, let's see how that works. So we're going to install Python Twitter and Watson Developer Cloud. And then Pixie Dust. So now I'm gonna import Pixie Dust and you'll see this jar path here. Um, GitHub.com, IBM Watson Data Lab, Spark Samples, Raw Master Disk, Streaming Twitter Assembly, 1.6.jar. So Streaming Twitter Assembly is the thing that Ben built that pulls in all that Twitter data. And I'm just going to pull it in. Pixie Dust install package will pull that in. I'm not going to restart my kernel because it wasn't upgraded. It was already in here. So Scala Bridge is going to, so I'm going to run this quick and scroll my credentials off the screen. <laughs> so Scala Bridge is allowing me to put even though I'm in a Python environment in my notebook, this program that Ben wrote is in Scala. And I can set some environment variables for my Twitter, um, my Twitter API access tokens. I can set some environment variables from within Python in the Scala back into the Scala environment. And then we're going to um, instantiate our Spark context. So right here, percent percent Scala. Here, here we're um, we instantiate that streaming Twitter application as a variable called demo, and then we set all these environment variables. These variables we're going to need to use the Twitter service and the Watson Tone Analyzer service. And uh, then this at the end of this cell, demo dot start Twitter streaming. It's going to run the application for 30 seconds, stream in Twitter data for 30 seconds. So we'll wait for 30 seconds. Hopefully it's working. <clears throat> 
so starting Twitter stream. And I have no, this is actually live. I have no idea what, sometimes there's some bad words in Twitter streams, so it's not my fault. <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna now we're gonna create a data frame out of this Twitter stream, which is pretty cool because remember, the Twitter application is in written in Scala, and we're gonna bring it into PySpark, Python and Spark. So you'll see Twitter stream stopped, batch completed 209 records, Twitter stream stopped. You can now create a SQL context and data frame with 158 tweets. And now we'll do that. And then you can do, and this is where the handoff to Natasha comes. So now she's got, now she's comfortable. She has a Python data frame or a PySpark data frame. And she can go and, you know, do, do data visualizations to her heart's desire. And so first we're just going to do some, you know, basic stuff. You'll probably always do group the tweets by user, author and user ID. This is just regular, regular Python or regular PySpark. Uh, you'll see here some cool things about <clears throat> the Watson Tone Analyzer. So these tweets are, you know, scored for anger and disgust. And this is really interesting. So the idea, I didn't really talk about this much, but the marking department wants this because they want some idea of uh, what, you know, how people are feeling about their products. And this is something that actually comes up. Things like... Um, Situations like a couple years ago, Volkswagen had that big fraud problem with how they talked about their diesel engines, um, fuel economy rating or fuel economy performance, and they got a lot of, and to be able to understand what they wanted to do to, you know, counteract that bad publicity in the marketplace, they could have used something like this to understand how people were reacting. Um, I'm not going to explain every line of this, the link to this. You can run this yourself. This is all on GitHub. But what I want to get to so now we're going to call Watson Personality Insights on the text and try to get an idea of what kind of person they are. There's some really interesting stuff. Um, eventually, in here, we're going to compare this to Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton because we, ori we originally built this this demo about six months ago when that was a more of an interesting topic. <clears throat> so I gotta wait for the um, wait for the back end spark in engine to catch up with me. Here we go. So here's the first look at the Pixie Dust display visualization um, features. Oh. I got to drive this thing here. So what I did here is I made a chart, a bar chart using the bouquet library. And if I go all this, so we're still in a Jupyter Notebook cell, but you have a lot of user interface goodness in here. You've got this little um, graphical menu here with a little table icon and the, the line chart thingy. If I do the drop down here, you'll see for any data frame, you have all these options, or Natasha would have all these options for quickly displaying uh, visualizing data, bar chart, line chart, scatter plot, pie chart, maps. If you have latitude, longitude in your data frame, you can make maps out of it. That's the part I actually worked on. Um, so here we chose to do a bouquet chart. So these users in our sample tweets database, these are how they, <coughs> these are how they come out in terms of their personality around whether they need closeness or they need curiosity. I can go in here and change my render to matplotlib. See, you'll see why we use bouquet because that looks a little nicer. I could also just look at the table as a data as a table. 
which this is really nice um, if you hate the way <laughs> if you hate the way you just you know sort of quickly look at your data frames in in a Jupyter notebook this is a really nice little very nice way now right now we're limited to go back to options right now we are uh, limited to how many rows we show you we're showing only a hundred rows but we'd like to build you know you could jump in this is an open source project you could jump in and help us make the table uh, the table widget more useful let's go back to the bar chart so you can see how fun this is versus you know coding a million spending hours and hours coding different visualizations just to you know quickly switch between bar charts and line charts and pie charts okay then we'll move in here compare twitter users personality insight scores with last year's presidential candidates this is just a fun thing i'm not going to spend a lot of time here um, <clears throat> Then you can get all that, you know, normal stuff you do. But I need to move to the end here. So you can go in and, you know, look at, look at the, uh, how this was done if you're interested in more detail. But I'm going to jump back to the presentation. So basically you get the idea all the things you'd normally do in data science. So we brought in from the Twitter streaming API, we brought in all this data and then, and the, and a web developer built that application and we brought it into the Python environment. And there's lots of, there's a lot of really interesting little functions in here that you can grab and use if you're interested. Mm-hmm. So the question was the person personality insight types. Yeah. Anger, disgust, fear, joy, set. Did did <clears throat> are they user definable or were they no? They were given to us by Watson Personality Insight Service. Those are all built into the service. So yeah, there's a whole <clears throat> whole another talk I could do around. <laughs> A whole nother 40 minutes on the Watson personality insight, personality insight service. Just a formal question. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about what the uh, intended purpose of it is. So is it to recommend potential line, uh, potential uh, basis for engagement with the personalities? Because I can see says things like needs curiosity, needs closeness. So is it basically telling me as a business that mm -hmm. this, this character based on the Twitter analysis of the Twitter, uh, what do you call it, uh, or analysis of the tweets is the kind of person you want to engage with on mm -hmm. the basis of providing them some form of a, a closer relationship. Yeah, well one example I have in another presentation is let's say you have, a lot, one thing companies like to do is they have guest bloggers, you know, um, star bloggers uh, publish content around, you know, create better brand awareness and <clears throat> create some, you know, affinity with people who are already famous. So you might use a personality, ins personality insights to find out which of your customers are extroverts. And those people, you might, you know, send them a travel blog or something like that. You might send them something associated with that versus somebody who has more of a introverted personality who, you know, may be interested in a whole other field of stuff. So if you had three different star bloggers that you were that you could assign to different customers. You could use personal insights to figure out how to make that most effective. Um, so I'm going to jump back into the presentation because this was, you know, this looks pretty useful. So they go back to the VP, I think, here. Uh, what happened here? Okay, these are a little bit out of, the, out of order. I went through some of these already. So, you know, the VP loves it. You saw some great tables and charts there. Um, 
but the executives who are going to use this are going to actually want to touch it. They're not going to want, they're not going to be able to write, you know, run the notebook cells or tweak them. They want to be able to, but they're going to want to have some interactivity and be able to do some filtering and real time charting without writing any code. So we took Pixie Dust, which is basically a bunch of Python code to automate what you would do in the cells already. And then, but then at the end, you're kind of limited to what you can, what you can, uh, how you can operate it because you just have the drop down GUIs. If you want to change what data is showing, you actually have to change the data frame with Python. So we created a, another extensibility layer called Pixie Apps, which lets you take the Pixie Dust code and instantiate it or extend it into um, an application environment. I'm not explaining this well, but the idea is that you can take those Python classes and you can use them in an HTML environment. So <clears throat> it's almost like another sort of templating language. I'm just going to quickly run through this and get down to that cool part. So this was one way to do running through that Jupyter notebook cell by cell was one way to do this, um, to build this application. Now put that aside for a second. There's a whole nother way to do it built on uh, the Pixie app framework. So once again, we're going to go in here. We're going to do demo equals Pixie Dust streaming Twitter. We're going to set our uh, environment variables for Twitter access, Watson tone analyzer access. We're going to install, we're going to pip install the Pixie Dust Twitter demo. So this is, I don't, in a 40 minute presentation, I don't have enough time to show all the code about how you do the HTML work. Is this working? But, so it's just right now, it's just a jar that gets installed, but trust me, these are HTML. This is a lot of HTML in a cell, and there's some you know, extra tags in the HTML, in the HTML elements that let you pull in classes. So if you worked in any templating language, this is based on Jinja, but any templating language, you know you extend, um, you can extend your HTML by putting in new, <coughs> new attributes inside the, inside the div classes or things like this. This is not showing so well on the screen, so the gray isn't showing, but anyway. So the same way we, <coughs> I ran some code to start off the Twitter feed, now we have a user interface to do it. So I'm gonna click this button at the bottom, start streaming. And it starts kicking off. Um, before in the cell you saw some of these messages, now you're gonna see it in the user interface and you're actually gonna see the tweets coming in over here. So this is all stuff you can do with the Pixie app framework. If I hover over, oh, it starts to build a chart. If I hover over, the, over a tweet, it'll show me the, um, the sentiment analysis and the personality insights. This person has an extra version or emotional range of 4%, joy, 8%, sadness. So this is, I can filter, I don't, know what I'd filter these tweets by. But you'll see you can have an app, <clears throat> you can build an application that automatically creates the bar chart. We're charting based on uh, some of these sentiment, some of these personality insight things. If you hover over here, you'll just see analytical, agreeableness, anger. So I'm gonna stop streaming. This is just this is just a demo application. I think it's just it's just pulling in the whole Twitter fire hose or the deca hose, the ten percent. So it's just grabbing whatever is coming through Twitter right now and scoring it with personality insights. Obviously, if you were building a real application, you would you know start with your hashtags that you were interested in, and only pull in that data. So this is just a proof of concept. But you can see, so this, you know, all the stuff we did in Python, 
um, by hand, we now had a web developer do with HTML tags, and they'd have to spend a, probably a week or so learning the, our special templating language, but you can, you know, a web developer would be much more comfortable doing that. And you're still actually in the Jupyter Notebook. You've, you're, this is actually a, a dialog box popping out of a cell. So, you know, you've created, just to finish up here, you've created um, a system of orchestration. You've created one environment in which data scientists and web developers can work and be, not be completely loosely coupled like web services, but be a little more tightly coupled uh, so that you can get more work done and have the performance benefits of having the Spark backend for big data, you know, which you can't really get if you try to loosely couple your, your uh, technology team through web APIs. So, you know, understand it's a lot, I think, for the last 10 years, everything was about, you know, loosely coupling your teams through web APIs and everything should have an API. Well, that's great, but when you start getting into big data and you want some real-time feedback and performance and you want high interactivity with the data uh, like this, web APIs don't really cut it, I don't think. And so you need a platform that's sort of closer to the metal in which web developers and data scientists can still be productive. And that's what uh, I think we've, we've uh, delivered here. And so there's just end, okay, <laughs> a second. Just to summarize, I think, um, you know, Pixie Dust is an open source app, an open source framework built on top of Jupyter Notebooks, which you can participate in. Pixie Apps is uh, another thing you can just learn and be productive with and not even learn Pixie Dust. And then you could also help us uh, build out some of those features of Pixie Dust so we can get more mapping features and bar charting features and all that great stuff. So thanks. Thanks for coming. <laughs>